Hey everyone, welcome back to the dining room shop. I wanted to talk for a second today about methods of driving ultra precision spindles and show a little idea I had for one the other day. I'll uh, give a little bit of background first. So often we think about spindles as things that already have motors in them. So something like the uh, spindle you'd use on your, your CNC router or something, right? With a built-in induction motor. Uh, but many times, at least in the air bearing world, this is not the case. Our spindle is simply an arrangement of very accurate air bearings uh, that can support a load. But if we want to power it somehow, we need a way to drive it. We need a way to deliver torque and rotate the shaft, right? So the thing is, if we're interested in sub-micro inch, sub, sub -micro inch air motion, we need to be very careful about how we do this. A poorly implemented spindle drive can very quickly turn your nice air bearing spindle into a terrible one. Uh, but why is this, right? So an ideal drive does not apply any you know, linear forces uh, to the spindle. It just applies a, a pure torque to the shaft. Unfortunately, this is rarely achieved. Also, unfortunately, all bearings have a finite stiffness. So if a load is applied, the bearings will deflect and the spindle axis will move by some amount. A time or position varying force applied through the bearings as the spindle rotates results in a time or position varying displacement of the axis of rotation, which is the very definition of air motion. We want to avoid this. So when thinking of ways of driving an ultra-precision spindle, we can come to some pretty obvious conclusions quickly. Uh, for one, no teeth, right? No gears. Think about the forces that an involute gear tooth profile exerts uh, as, it, as it applies a torque and rotates. That uh, force vector at the contact point is constantly changing in uh, direction and magnitude. And if your gear isn't perfect and there's, it's not perfectly meshed, you know, there's going to be some interruption as it transitions from one tooth uh, to another. Other tooth methods like timing belt pulleys aren't quite as nefarious, but in general, you know, you're asking for trouble if you have a periodic structure to your method of torque application. So let's look at a few other ways of driving the spindle. We'll start with the, the simplest possible drive, right? Two pulleys and a smooth belt. In theory, this is actually great. This will do the trick. And even practically, it can be done to a satisfactory degree. Uh, but you do need to be careful though, because variations in belt thickness, uh, belt set or memory, uh, or run out of the pulleys uh, mounted on the spindle like this, uh, will all cause a variation in belt tension uh, as it spins. Variation in belt tension is a variation of radial load on the spindle and thus induced air motion. For reference, uh, a three inch blockhead uh, air bearing spindle, which I've sort of drawn here and we'll see in a moment, has a radial stiffness of 0.33 pounds per micro inch. So if our belt tension changes by, point, by just 0.33 pounds over the course of a rotation, uh, we've now exceeded our total air motion tolerance by 100%, you know, assuming we wanna, we wanna keep the spindle in spec. There are, of course, other methods. Uh, you've got your litany of different types of uh, shaft couplings, you know, tooth lovejoy couplings, uh, cut flexure couplings like this, uh, bellows couplings, double disc couplings, and there's, you know, there's a, a bunch of different types. All of these seek to minimize constraint in degrees of freedom other than the uh, rotational one we're interested in which allows them to be, you know, in most cases, the idea is we just want to be tolerant to misalignment of the motor and the, whatever the motor is driving. Uh, but that also, that also means that it's just going to generate less nefarious forces for given amounts of, of misalignment, which is what we're trying to minimize. Some are certainly better than others. You know, bellows, couplings, and double discs, I think, are the, uh, the best. Uh, that's just, just uh, my opinion. Uh, but none are truly decoupled in all degrees of freedom but one. Uh, they have they have a non-zero stiffness in, in these other directions to some extent. Shaft couplings do differ from belt drives in that one regard though. They are supposed to be torsionally very stiff. Uh, this is of course necessary if your spindle was to be under some sort of tight positional servo control. 
uh, you can't have a large spring uh, or heaven forbid backlash in between your forcer and your plant plant or you know your spindle unless you enjoy suffering uh, an o-ring belt like this is not likely going to be stiff enough between uh, a stiff enough coupling between your motor and your spindle to allow for a nice positional servo you know i can rotate this pulley quite a bit and that's not slipping that's just the belt being very springy so that's obviously not going to work for for servo control now you can of course get a much stiffer belt uh, but the stiffer the belt the more sensitive you become to pulley runout and that the more that will cause a large change in radial force on your spindle but that's not necessarily the focus of this topic or video i'm more so just talking about drives for a constant-ish velocity application, uh, like a lathe spindle, where we just need to we just need to apply a torque in a way that doesn't harm our motion performance. Uh, then I'm not setting the requirement that we need extreme torsional coupling as well. Another extremely common method, which is an obvious choice most of the time, is integral motorization. Right, simply eliminate all couplings and build a brushless motor directly into the back of your spindle. No contact, no friction, seems good. And yeah, generally it is really good, uh, especially for, for servo systems. Um, but you know, just like the rest of, the, the rest of these things, uh, care must be taken to, to do it right. Uh, symmetry is the key to this working well, basically. Uh, if your motor rotor, which is mounted on your spindle, is running out, or there's a lack of concentricity uh, between the stator and the spindle axis, uh, this can very quickly begin to introduce forces uh, besides a pure torque, some sort of radial forces, um, especially in the case of, of iron core permanent magnet motors. Heat and subsequent thermal expansion uh, may also be a consideration, uh, depending on the use case and how much uh, power the motor needs to apply. Um, you know, sometimes moving the, the heat generating forcer uh, away from the spindle and not bolting it directly to it uh, is uh, desirable. So we've looked at a few different methods so far. Uh, we've gotten some nice candidates, uh, but I'd like to invite you to take a step back and look at the problem again. Like I said before, our drive is inducing error motion because it's applying a time or position varying force through the bearings. All of the methods examined thus far seek to solve this problem by minimizing the time or position varying force. Let's reframe and consider the last words of the original sentence. What if instead of spending more time or money trying to eliminate these forces due to you know, misalignment or run out, so on, we simply avoid sending them through the bearing? The simplest possible implementation of a drive like this uh, is what I refer to as a pinch belt drive. So we have one belt uh, but now it's going to be supported by two pulleys, uh, a drive and an idler. Those will just be my thumbs. And those go on either side uh, of the driven pulley on the spindle, and you tension it by, you know, just moving the pulleys apart like this. So now let's imagine what happens if there's pulley run out and the belt tension fluctuates. The radial force on the spindle is being applied at two places, you know, 180 degrees apart. So as the belt uh, tension fluctuates, and this is, you know, maybe going like this or something, maybe even just from one side, the spindle sees a, you know, negligible compression from the belt tension, but the two contact points being the uh, actual force uh, from the, the belt tension uh, nets to zero, uh, through the bearings at least. So this is pretty cool. Uh, there is a con though with this design, and that's just its generally poor ability to transfer meaningful amounts of torque just because of the very small contact area between the belt uh, and the pulley. So, it, you know, it has a tendency to slip if the load, uh, load requirements are high. And so here's the idea I came up with recently to address this issue. I think it's potentially neat. I'm calling this the uh, high torque decoupled belt drive. Um, I'm, I'm, now, I'm quite positive it's been done before. Uh, I haven't personally bumped into it yet, I've not seen it before, 
But the, the fundamental concept here is, is far too basic to be novel. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if someone came up with this back in the 1800s or something. Uh, but essentially, we have two radial uh, O-ring drives, uh, although, you know, one of these could be just an idler. I just happen to have two of these crappy little DC motors uh, that I'm using for the demonstration here. Um, and they're fixed to the same frame, which critically is decoupled from the spindle stator via this uh, flexure mechanism here of very low stiffness. So that allows the frame to float back and forth like this quite freely. Let's examine the path of force here. So regardless of the belt tension, the belt tension can be very high, you know. We have the tension from one belt trying to push the, you know, move the frame in this direction, but that load is transferred through the frame and reacted to, reacted against, uh, by the other belt tension. So for a perfectly symmetric situation here, for even for very high belt tensions, uh, there is no load uh, going through the stator and going through the bearings. It's completely circumvented. If we look at the sort of structural loop, it's really just this this small path here, whereas a you know radial uh, O-ring drive where there wasn't this other half and there was no flexures, the path of load would be through the belt, through the rotor, through the stator, and then back into the frame where the motor is mounted. So you know as such, if we have pulley run out or a lumpy belt or something, uh, that's of course going to result in an increase in belt tension, right? But that force will simply, you know, move through the frame uh, and start to tension the other belt more, uh, which reacts to it. So you can sort of see, if I squeeze in on the belt there, uh, the, the whole thing just sort of shifts to find a new uh, equilibrium point and thus put a net zero force on the uh, rotor itself. This offers the same degree of non-influencing performance as the previous design, uh, yet the fact that it's got two uh, wraparound uh, radial belts, which are covering you know 50% of the pulley perimeter, uh, means that you can simultaneously deliver uh, meaningful torque uh, as well as being non-influencing. So you get both. And best of all, we can use a super super stiff belt, and I don't really need to worry about the pulleys having exactly zero runout. Uh, so you can have a very high torsional torsional coupling stiffness uh, between the, the drive and the the uh, spindle as well. This brings up a broader point which I think is important to keep in mind. You know, many of, or even most requirements for mechanical precision and tight tolerances in the actual manufacturing of a machine or mechanism are necessitated by a departure from kinematic ideality in, in the design. A rigid four-legged stool doesn't actually rock if you just lap each of the four legs to be the same length to within a tenth of a micron. You know, just as a radial belt uh, drive won't induce any air motion, if your pulleys have a run out of zero and the belt is of a perfectly uniform cross section. Both of these things can be done, but you know, at what cost? Sometimes if we just give the stool three legs or avoid directing any belt forces through the spindle bearings in the first place, we can produce a design that's more performant yet cheaper than the alternative. I really, uh, I really enjoy engineering problems where you get to reframe the uh, design thinking like that. It's quite fun. Now, of course, you can dream up a thousand different implementations of this concept, uh, just as there are countless other methods of driving a spindle, which I have not covered today, and, you know, all with their own pros and cons as well. I just wanted to bring up a few options to highlight the, di the difference between a uh, coupled and decoupled drive, which avoids putting its forces through the spindle bearings. And I'll end with one more consideration on this topic, and that is uh, the idea of sensitive direction. You know, it's important to think about what direction is the drive going to induce air motion in, and what direction do you actually care about air motion in. So let's consider a rotor grinding fixture as an example. Uh, typically, you know, here's our block out here. What you'll see is this mounted to the table, and typically, uh, just, just like the first example I gave you, I have a simple radial O-ring drive. So there's, you know, you've got a motor mounted here somewhere else with a, with a pulley on it, and a belt. And 
and your grinding wheel is of course up here, spinning like that, and you have your part that's being ground, mounted on the spindle. So if this was done poorly, you know, typically it's done very well, but if it's done poorly, um, and say there's a bunch of uh, run out in your, your pulley or whatever, um, what can that manifest in? Well, you might induce some uh, radial air motion since you're pulling more or less on the, the spindle in this direction. Uh, but since we're doing that at a, at a radius from the center, we may also introduce some tilt air motion, right? That might, might be cocking the whole uh, rotor over like this. But in rotor grinding, what's the sensitive direction we care about? It's axial. We only care about the wheel's position with respect to the part you know, in the up and down direction. So if there's no axial air motion, we, we might be all right. Now, tilt air motion, you know, the, the whole spindle rotor tilting like this, that can manifest uh, as axial air motion out at, you know, out at some, some radius here, R. Uh, but the fact of the setup is the grinding wheel is centered over the spindle axis uh, and we're just moving it in and out of the page like this. So because we position the wheel over the center line of the spindle, uh, we're sort of immune from any tilt errors uh, that could be induced by this belt drive as well. Note that this would not be the case if we oriented this drive differently and had the motor sort of come out of the page at 90 degrees and the belt, you know, go like this. Uh, in that case then, the tilt air motion would be tilting like this, right? And that would uh, manifest as an axial air motion um, at some radius as we move the wheel away from the center of the part. So it's not just convenient to have the uh, motor sitting off to the side of the spindle here on the mag chuck. Uh, it's actually optimal from a sensitive direction standpoint. Conversely to this situation, Let's imagine you're trying to drive a spindle for a, a diamond turning machine where you're turning the uh, diameter of like a big drum roller or something. Uh, let's imagine the grinding wheel is in here and imagine you have a long part that you're, you're turning with a, 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 a nice diamond tool there and you're turning the OD like this. In that case, you know, maybe it, it would be most desirable to drive the spindle uh, with a drive wheel like this, where you have sort of a rubber ring wrapped around the outside of it, and you just press that into the face of the spindle there. In this situation, uh, if there's any run out of a drive wheel, uh, that's going to be manifest as an axial air motion as it's pushing uh, like this on the spindle. Uh, which your turning process uh, is insensitive to. So, just some food for thought there. Sensitive direction is a good concept to keep in mind in all in all cases. But yeah, that's about it. Um, in the next video, hopefully, uh, I'm going to try and set up a uh, test where we can actually measure the effect or lack thereof that this drive has on the air motion of the spindle. And that's what the shaft here is for, and to work out how to mount an encoder to it so we can take air motion data. But a little more work to be done there. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed that, and thanks for watching.